mysterywire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com. As you know, the UAP task force had a a gigantic task in front of us. It put together uh, as much information as it could, prepared a briefing presentation that's been given to Congress, uh, the defense community, contractors. It's been gone to, uh, I think, the Joint Chiefs, uh, various different agencies around uh, Washington. You are familiar with a lot of that material, I would assume, the videos and photos and images. Are you? Uh, you know, I, George, I, yes, I have to be a little careful about uh, right. going into too much detail because Clearly, uh, I, I, I am not a uh, DOD civilian anymore, so therefore I, I cannot, I do not have the authority to speak on behalf of the U.S. government, but to suffice it to say that a lot of this stuff really isn't, isn't much of a surprise to me. Um, well, we released something. Uh, I'm sure by now you've seen it. It's from the USS Omaha. Uh, you know, there were earlier, there were images of stills that were uh, uh, part of a slide that was used in a UAP task force presentation of these spherical objects seen uh, around the USS Omaha, one that traveled with the ship for about an hour, and then boom, went into the water. And then they went after it, couldn't find it. I realize you probably can't comment directly on that video, but can we speak in general terms uh, about the capabilities of whatever these things are? I mean, as I think Chris Mellon has said, if, if we have failed to see the Chinese building something that is transmedia, that does what that thing did, uh, it's an incredible intelligence failure. Uh, George, that's a great question. Uh, and you're referring to one of the observables that we had at the Pentagon's program, ATIP, that, was, that we refer to as transmedium travel. And transmedium travel is very significant. What it means, is, it, it means that you have the ability to operate in multiple domains or multiple environments. Now, to put that into context, we do indeed have technology. We do have vehicles that can operate in multiple environments. Let's take a seaplane, for example. But when you really look at it, a seaplane is neither a really good aircraft or a really good boat. It's a compromise. It's design compromise because you're you're trying to operate in multiple environments. And yet here we are looking at things now and collecting information and data on things that have the ability to operate seemingly without any type of performance compromise that can operate in the atmosphere and even underwater. Uh, And and that is, you know, that's. That's that's something unique. Um, we do have certain capabilities, for example, certain missiles that people are familiar with in submarines that we can launch out of a tube and for a very short period of time, it's underwater and then pops out and flies. Um, but there really isn't a whole lot of examples where we have uh, some sort of technology that has the ability to fly for, let's say, an hour next to a, a Navy destroyer and then all of a sudden uh, drop into the water and continue to operate as if, if the water wasn't even there. Um, And so you're right, it's very perplexing. Um, Again, you can't comment on specifics, but the USS Omaha, the information that we released, it was one of at least five different ships that were buzzed in July 2019 by these unknowns. And they they weren't able to see them coming in. They weren't able to see them leaving. And it seemed like these things wanted to be seen. They were making a display or a, a performance. The USS Omaha Spear travels with the ship right along with it for like an hour. It's like, hey, take some close-ups, here I am, and then it goes in the water. I know that we have uh, increased technical capabilities and sensors to track things like this, unknowns to track the adversaries and enemies, but um, is there uh, a point at which we can say the phenomenon is upping its game, that it is making itself known in a, a more demonstrable way than we have seen before? Yeah, so that's a really good good question, George. And the question is, are we beginning to notice an uptick, if you will, in provocations or what we would call in defense terms show of force? Um, it's not uncommon that we will display our capabilities to an enemy or an adversary. and They will, of course, do the same with us in order to demonstrate our capabilities. Basically, a warning, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't mess with us because look what we can do. Um, the question you're asking is, is what we are witnessing here a, a, a potential provocation? In essence, look at this technology that we can do. You don't have it, uh, so better be careful. I don't know. It, it certainly, I think if you talk to certain folks uh, inside the intelligence community, they may come up with that assessment, that this is clearly 
someone or something trying to to be obvious and say, look, we're here and we really don't we don't really respect your <laughs> your, uh, your your distances and, and whatnot, these limitations, and restrictions you put on your vessels. Uh, you know, we're going to do whatever we want. That's possible. Uh, it could also be something that is unintentional. Now, when I say unintentional, deliberate in that they're there, but not necessarily trying to provoke a response. Maybe there it is just as curious uh, uh, about us as we are curious about it. Um, so we have to be careful assigning intent behind something. Um, I think that's that's a, certainly a natural question, but I, I don't think we have enough data yet to to address that. You know, from from a threat perspective in the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, there's really two parts of an equation to determine uh, if if something is a threat, and that is capabilities versus intent. Uh, now we are we are seeing some of the capabilities up close and personal. That's for sure but we still have no idea the intent. And so therefore it's, it's, really, it's really a tough egg to crack because we, we really have no idea why these things seem to be so, so provocative and pervasive. At a minimum, it would seem to be surveillance, isn't it? Or it's in, you know, uh, it's an interactive quality to it. It's not hiding, it's right there. And it seems to be congregating around military facilities, ships, things like that. Well, that, that for me is a greatest problem. And that for me is, is the greatest question and challenge. Why is it that we see a, a, a large frequency of these, these incidents occurring in and around controlled U.S. airspace and particularly around uh, military assets and equities? Uh, that, that for me is, is the biggest question because you're right. From an adversarial perspective, um, certainly that would be indicative of some sort of show of force. Uh, but again, we, we just simply don't have enough data. And I think probably this is why people in Congress and the government are taking this topic so seriously, because we spend millions and millions of dollars each year trying to protect our military assets and equities uh, from, from, from the enemy, uh, from a wide spectrum of threats, whether it's an intelligence or, or a physical threat or whatnot. And yet um, we still have no idea what these things are, or what they're doing in and around our, our military uh, military equities. You know, we've, you and I have talked about this before. You've made public statements. I've had my own reports, uh, news reports over the years about the interest of whatever this unknown intelligence is, the interest in nuclear capabilities, nuclear missile bases, nuclear carriers, nuclear uh, power plants. And, and you have remarked how uh, concerned you are about that. Can you say, uh, and again, this is pretty sensitive, but can you address the idea of whether or not we have tried to confirm their interest in nuclear assets, say an experiment. If we do X, will they do Y? Yeah. Um, so, George, I can I can tell you definitively. We we know there's a, a a connection. There's a congruency because there is official U.S. government reporting going back decades from very senior officials to other very senior officials that have established and substantiate the fact that there is a UAP interest in our nuclear equities. So that 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 that's a fact. That's that's already occurred. We have uh, reporting on that through certain channels, uh, and 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 the the evidence is is quite compelling. The question is why, and and that is something we don't know yet. As far as um, going into details specifics about our nuclear equities, unfortunately, I, I I'm not at liberty to do that uh, because when you start getting into the sources and methods and specifics, that information becomes quite quite sensitive very very quickly. Uh, but there is already reporting that has been uh, been been made available to to the open public, if you know where to look for it, that substantiates without a shadow of a doubt that there is interest in our nuclear equities. And, and let me further state that it's not just ours; it, it, it's also other countries as well. And for me, that is probably uh, even more indicative of the fact that we may be dealing with something here that we we really don't understand. Because if we're having the same problem that Russia is in other countries. Then, then chances are this is a, 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 this is a topic that is of mutual concern and interest for, for, for more than just the United States. In fact, it would paint the picture that this is not a U.S. phenomenon at all, but this is rather a global phenomenon. You know, we're, we're both pretty excited about the level of media coverage, national media coverage of the issue. But as you know, there continues to be some confusion uh, among national media and some reporters about ATIP versus OSAP. Um, you know, we have reported before about the $22 million, which went to OSAP, not ATIP. Can you clear this up for, 
for the benefit of all about those two efforts. Did they coexist at the same time? Did one grow out of the other? Which one got the money and, and what the setup was then yeah. and what it became afterward? Sure, George, I, I know there's continued confusion on this. And let me just state yet again, and I, I, this is probably the thousandth time I've, I've said this, okay? I was not part of OSAP, okay? I was part of ATIP. So any questions that regard OSAP, I, I, I'm really not qualified to answer. That was a, a, a predecessor of mine who was running that uh, along with uh, the aerospace company that everybody now, now knows was associated with it. ATIP was part in the beginning, grew out of the OSAP, but it became its, its own thing uh, as time progressed. And my colleagues and I continued to run this effort all the way till the day I left 2017. And by the way, it continued after the day I left as well. There is also documentation, official government documentation, probably hasn't seen the light of day yet, that absolutely substantiates that. So uh, again, I, I, I guess I, I, I understand there may be some confusion, but uh, I, at this point, I've addressed this over and over again. Again, for, forgive me my, my frustration here, but it's, 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 it's something that continues to come up. And so one more time for anybody who may have any questions, OS, I was not part of OSAP. I was part of ATIP. And so uh, anybody has questions about OSAP probably needs to direct those questions to somebody who was, you know, who was, who was in that effort at the time. Um, so $22 million, Senator Reid and his colleagues secure that funding. It goes into a contract. Uh, through the DIA, Bigelow Aerospace gets the money, and it studies not only UFOs, but a much, much wider array of uh, strange phenomena that occur in proximity to UFOs, don't really have an explanation. ATIP existed after the money for OSAP was pulled, and you know we don't know a lot about what OSAP did in terms of there hasn't been a lot of release of documents produced by that. That might be coming. But the same can be true as ATIP. It was it kept going after the money for OSAP was pulled, and it studied the kinds of cases we're talking about now: national security, it did. military encounter. It did. It did, and not necessarily not not necessarily the folks in OSAP uh, were were part of ATIP in its later years. Um, you know, ATIP became a a very small, very niche, very nuanced capability that was run primarily through government people. Uh, the hopefully at some point the person who replaced me will be coming out uh, in the public and be able to to have additional conversation. Right now, I think most people just think I was the guy in HIP when in fact there were other people as well. And the program continued after I left, uh, and that morphed into what we now know as a UAP task force. Um, so, how hopeful are you about the UAP task force report that's uh, due at the end of June? Uh, you think it might it's going to be preliminary or interim that leads to something bigger? Uh, I, I first of all, I, I, as I've st stated before, George, I, I don't think we're going to have a, a complete uh, assessment by June. Um, I just think it's 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 too too far of a bridge to cross. I think we need more time. So I wouldn't be surprised if that if there if there is some sort of extension uh, or or delay to the to the 180 day report. Um, I'll share with you that I'd spoken to some people before and uh, who were on these similar type of evaluation teams, and it took them eight months just to get the appropriate security clearances to to do an evaluation. Then after that, it took them another entire year just to do the evaluation itself. So uh, I, I think you know I. I the, it's good news and bad news. The bad news is I, I don't think people are going to get everything that they expect at the at the end of, of June. But the good news is I think that given more time, we'll be able to get more fidelity into what this is. And let's not forget that the congressional request for was to have this report done at the unclassified level. So that means you can share a lot more information with the public. You know how hard it is. You've 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 been one of the people who's gone knocking on the doors, uh, where the keepers of the secrets, where you think the really good, sensitive stuff is. Uh, you know, it seems to me the closer they get to the real goodies, the harder it's going to be and the more pushback there's going to be, don't you think? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, unless unless it's we've reached critical mass, you know, there's, it's a double-edged sword. I've often said that at one point, uh, we considered this topic very much like a fine wine and where you, the longer you keep a cork on it, the better it gets. And now what we're realizing is this, this, this topic is probably more like rotten fruit or what, rotten vegetables in the refrigerator. The longer it stays in there, the more it's gonna smell. And so it's probably time to clean out the fridge. And I, I, I think we're at a point now where it's gonna be very hard knowing what we know now about this topic 
to not continue to ask the hard questions. And as you say, put the genie back in the bottle. I, 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 I'm not sure how you can do that. You have too many folks that, that are on the Hill in our legislative uh, branch and too many folks in the executive branch and former leaders both on both sides of the aisle, by the way, coming out saying, yeah, I've been briefed and, and this is compelling and it's real and we don't know what it is and we need to figure it out. Well, it's not something you can get to the bottom of in six months or eight months or even a year. It seems like there should be a permanent ongoing program. Are you optimistic about that? Uh, you know, I, I've always said, for the record, I think we need to have a uh, an enduring capability. And, and I'll further go by saying, ultimately, this may not even be in the big picture, a DOD or an intelligence community issue. Uh, they may have part of it. But uh, I think we need to bring more people under the tent. I think we need to bring in scientists and academics. Uh, we need to bring in uh, some of the, the perhaps national laboratories to come in and Department of Energy and FAA, because this topic uh, impacts more than just potentially national security. It, it, it impacts everyone and it impacts everybody equally yet differently. And so this may be really at some point a philosophical conversation. It might be a theological conversation. It might be a social conversation. Uh, and, and at that point, that's not really government's job to, to be in, involved in those aspects. Well, you know, you and I have had private conversations about this over the years. And, uh, you know, the OSAP investigation got into some pretty weird areas, areas that really would be uncomfortable for the Department of Defense to investigate. You know, again, I, I don't want to comment on, on the OSAP piece um, because it's, it's a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation right. for me. Um, I've always made it very clear that I was not part of, of OSAP, uh, the, the formal program. Uh, and I'm just going to I'm just going to state that because, you know, I I, I can't speak uh, from an educated perspective about that program. Um, okay. My 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 experience was on the ATIP side of the house, not not OSAP. And, and you know, from what I've told you, I will say this from the people I spoke with. It was it was very compelling that the results of, of OSAP were indeed legitimate and were compelling. Um, but I, I can't I can't speak beyond that. One other question. So you've been out in front for a couple of years now. I know there was some trepidation when you stepped out on that stage, October 2017, with Tom DeLong and Hal and and Chris and some other colleagues. Um, and you have been beaten up and pummeled and accused of all kinds of stuff. I'd like to get a sense of how it's going for you now. Whether you know, every couple of weeks, the Pentagon puts out another statement that seems to contradict things it said before about you, about ATIP. Is there still pressure? Are you under fire? Are you, how are you handling it? Uh, George, I won't get into specifics. I, I've obviously angered some people uh, within the Beltway. And, and I've had, I've had uh, my security clearance uh, looked at and scrutinized. Um, I've had my, my, uh, my credibility attacked uh, and, and frankly, statements that have been put out that are, that are just flatly wrong and inaccurate. Um, and I, I, I'm hopeful that the IG, uh, if you will, the, the, the inquiry that is being done will be able to resolve a, a lot of that for me. Um, it, it, is, it has been very challenging for me and, and for my family, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, I've been labeled as that UFO guy um, and, uh, it's, it hasn't, hasn't been easy. It's been very challenging. Um, you know, it, you wake up every day and you're trying to do a good job. And I, by the way, I don't get paid for this, right? So this is, this is something I'm doing because it's, it's, I, I believe it. I still feel it's the mission that I was given, uh, way back when, and I'm just trying to finish that mission. Um, it's, it's been extremely challenging. Um, there's times that, that frankly, if, if I could, if I could just disappear into the sunset, I certainly would. Uh, and I keep looking desperately for 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 the new new faces to step up and, and pick up the baton. Um, but in, until that day comes, I'm going to continue doing doing what I'm doing. Well, I mean, the 60 minutes thing, I think we've reached a new plateau, Lou, and I think uh, help is on the way. I think that that's that sets a new bar. It tells the other media, come on in. The water's fine. And uh, once there is cover for members of Congress the, to investigate further, uh, people uh, like you who are still in the shadows can come forward. And uh, I think that's the work that you guys have done. We, we reached a really critical point in this, a tipping point, and there's no going back. Well, George, it's been a collective effort. So again, I, I, can't, I can't take uh, credit for that. Uh, I appreciate the, the compliment, but that's something that really goes to everybody 
who's even watching your program right now. Uh, these are uh, people are, are having the conversation. They're having it around the water cooler. They're having it around the dinner table. Uh, they're having at their, you know, their church functions and it's making a difference. And, and the fact that the media now is finally having the courage to report on this topic, which was once considered so taboo and, and fraught with stigma and fringe, quite frankly, uh, I think says a lot about, about the, the courage of a lot of people now coming forward to have this conversation. Folks like the four pilots that, that we saw in 60 Minutes. Thanks, Lou. Talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure.